You can be seated. Theology is what, uh, what we practice sometimes. It's what we choose to believe. And as we believe, then we, we, try to, we try to live by that which we choose to believe. Theology has been, has been something that has changed down through the years. Things have been added. Things have been taken away. We have prospered in our theology. And sometimes our theology has led us to places that we don't necessarily need to be. I want you to understand my theology this morning in light of what's happened, in light of our prayer time this morning. I believe that we pass from death unto life on the day that we enter into the kingdom of God. I passed from death unto life when I was nine years old and I invited Christ to be a part of my life. I'm still physically alive. This body of mine is still physically alive. My consciousness is still very much alive. But I choose to believe by faith, and you can choose to believe something else if you like. I choose to believe that we're absent from this body and present with the Lord. Okay? I don't believe that we wait in a grave for hundreds of years before our body is resurrected again. I just, I find what Paul says far more pressing to me. You're absent from the body and present with the Lord. That means that when I leave this body... I am present with the Lord. No in-between. That when I leave this body, it is laid to rest. I don't need it anymore. When I'm present with the Lord, all things have passed. Sorrow is no more. Tears are no more. Sin is no more. All of the things that, that have impacted my life negatively have gone away. My body, all my all the functions of my body that don't work so well anymore are left behind. And I'm present immediately with the Lord. Now, there are several parables that kind of that kind of tell us that story. And today we're going to look at one of those parables. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 has been talking an awful lot about richness and wealth and being a good steward. And a couple of nights ago, we talked last week we talked about. Uh, an unrighteous steward and a righteous steward or managers. Uh, Wednesday night we talked a little bit about this idea of, of what we have and how we take care of it and even talked a little bit about divorce there, that the Pharisees had basically divorced Christ in a lot of ways, had, had neglected him or had moved away from him. Then Jesus tells a parable. Let's read the parable and then we'll go back and, and take it apart. Now there was a rich man. And he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Now let's, let's pause right now. The word habitually there is an important word. You don't always talk about people habitually doing things. Uh, the word there is in a negative connotation. He, he, it was his habit, practice to dress in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was slain at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. That, that would not be a pleasant sight, would it? And now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and he was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that, we may dip, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. Now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. If you are a Bible underliner, if you are a Bible marker, mark that verse. That is the key verse to this whole parable that's being said. Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. 
And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fix, so that those who wish to come over here from, uh, come from here, you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Aram said, They have Moses, they have the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Oftentimes, this passage of Scripture or this, uh, this parable has focused upon this idea of hell. And we often want to, we, we spend an awful light in that passage dealing with it's hot, it's burning, he needs a dip of water on the fingertip to, to soothe him, uh, warn my brothers. All of those kind of things are very much part of the parable. But the reality is that we focus on that and miss the key of the parable. The parable is there's a rich man and there's a guy named Lazarus. The first thing that I want you to understand about this passage of Scripture is the rich man is never named, but Lazarus is. It's important. It's it's the important part of this passage. All through the Scripture does Jesus not remind us that when it comes time to dividing in eternity... He says something like this, depart from me because I don't know who you are. Those of you that I know, welcome. Those of you that have a name, those of you that I I recognize. Now, I am am very proud of myself because I'm looking out at this congregation today and I could call every one of you by your name. And I, I take great pride in that. I know a lot of pastors that can't do that. Their congregations are very large and all that, and they they really can't call everybody by name. But not only that, I think I know most of your last names. Not only that, but I think I've got a story about every one of you. Now, those of you giggling know That when I say I've got a story about you, that might be a good story, but it might not be so good. We know that, don't you? I know you. I I, I take great pride in knowing you intimately sometimes, knowing you well. I know a lot of you pull for certain football teams. I know that some of you like the Braves. I know that some of you do this. I know what you do for a living. I know what cars you drive. I know, I know who you are. If I were to meet you on the street, I think I could call you by name. <clears throat> you know, I could say, hi, Wayne, or hi, Teresa, or hi, Jim. I would know you. If I saw you in a store, I would probably know you. Have you ever caught yourself in the situation where you knew the face but didn't know the name? You ever done that? I always have Jan stand next, real, next, real close to me, and I'll say, well, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Who is that? <laughs> What's their name? I know I'm supposed to know. I don't want to be embarrassed. I want to be able to call them by name. I have a desire to call them by name. Okay, understand what I'm just saying? Follow my illustration here for a moment. I really want to know who they are. I want to know their name. I want to know and be able to call their name, but <coughs> I just can't do it. That's the point of this parable. Jesus says that Lazarus had a name. God knew him. Now, you base that on whatever you want. You know, in our modern day, in the evangelical world, they got saved, and therefore Jesus knows his name. But that's not really the crux of this story. Where does, where does Lazarus get his knowledge Where did the rich man fail to get his knowledge? Jesus said it in the end of the parable. They have the law. They have Moses. They have the prophets. He doesn't know God. He's not encountered God. Whatever that may be, he's not part of God's family, whatever that's all about. Okay? We have Jesus. There's a parable that Jesus told that said that that, that we should have been able, at least Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, We should be able to know God by just looking around us, seeing his creation. We should know that there's a God. Did you see those telescope 
pictures that came out of the universe out there? Did you see that this week? It had this orange kind of looking like a hand. And all the Christians began to say, it's the hand of God. You know, we, 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 we get to see the hand of God. But it was amazing that a telescope could pick that picture up as clear as it did a gazillion miles from here. I was amazed by that. And my first response is, wow, God is so big, so strong, so powerful. We should know God. But just because that happened, God said, I gave you the law. And you should have been able to understand me by understanding a little bit about the law. And then I gave you the prophets, and they spoke, thus saith the Lord. And then I gave you my own son. We should know God. But what's far more important is that he should know us. You follow me here? That just because I know about God, just because I have a theology about God, just because there are certain things I believe about God does not necessarily mean that God knows my name. It's just called a rich guy, a rich man. But Lazarus, this poor beggar, covered with sores, dogs licking his wounds, sitting up beside the walls of the rich man, has a name. Let's go back to that key verse for a moment. Child, remember that during your life, you received good things. Now, is it bad that he received good things? No. What's bad? Is that because he had received good things, he had neglected spiritual things. You had your good things. And likewise, Lazarus had bad things. Did the bad things happen to Lazarus because God was angry at him or God didn't like him or that God was punishing him in some way, form, or fashion and that the rich man was rich because God was blessing him or God was condoning his lifestyle? No, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. What is being said here is that God knows Lazarus. Whatever was going on in Lazarus' heart, in his psyche, in his being, connected him with God enough that God said, He's made righteous by his faith. I know you, Lazarus. Now, in our modern day of thinking, we, we want to say something like this. Well, if God knew Lazarus, why didn't he do something about Lazarus' problem? Why didn't God heal the sores? Why didn't God give him food? Why didn't God provide medical attention for this poor, wretched man. He did. He provided a rich man who had the ability to get him medical attention, who had the ability to feed him properly, who had the ability to put him under shelter, who had the ability to take a cold drink of water to Lazarus. Ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? God, why don't you do something? The world is just going to hell in the handbasket. Why don't you do something, God? And his answer is, I did. I created you. I have given you the gift. I have given you the talent. I have given you the resource. The problem with the rich man is that he never saw himself as being used of God to minister to the needs of another. He sat outside his gate every day. If the rich man went to the market, he passed him. If the rich man came back from going to church that morning, he passed him. Every day that the rich man went out of his facility and into his facility, out of his home and into his home, he saw Lazarus, that 
wretched man and all the sores and all the problems with him and walk past him every day. That's why God does not know his name. What must I do to have eternal life? Well, you keep the commandments. Done that, done well by it. I've been keeping those commandments all my life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself was the response. And, and all of a sudden, he began to understand that. But then Jesus turned around and said this to that man. There's going to be a group of people one day that are going to stand before me. And I'm going to say to them, I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was sick, you didn't come to me. Let me paraphrase a little bit. I sat outside your gate every day and you never stopped. I had sores all over my body that the dogs were licking my sores and you provided no medical attention. I begged for the food, the crumbs that would fall off your table and never once did you give me a loaf of bread. And when they come, I will say what? Depart from me because I don't know who you are. But that doesn't hit us in the 21st century. But that doesn't hit us hard in the United States of America. If that doesn't hit us hard personally, that God's attention is not on us because we are wealthy. He really wants to know what are you going to do with the wealth that I've given to you. This man had everything. Nice house, lots of good food. What does it say? Habitually wore purple and fine linen. Man, he was a nice gentleman. But in the end, he lost it. The important thing here is the name. The second thing that I want to say to you about this passage is that the, that the man had the capability. He was a rich man. He was rich, but not very compassionate. He was rich, but not very generous. He was rich and extremely selfish. He had everything except the things that maybe God saw as important. Compassion, kindness, gentleness, love. Isn't it amazing that when you read through the scripture, you're going to find those words just exploding off the pages? You ever read that passage about the fruits of the Spirit? That the Spirit of God gives you what? Gentleness, kindness, compassion, and, and, you know, for a long time there, I, I went in the 70s, they wanted everybody to know what their spiritual gift was. What's your spiritual gift? And then they had these silly questionnaires that they would give us in college, and you could fill it out, and you knew exactly if you answered a certain way that your spiritual gift would be whatever it was going to, what it produced. I mean, I could change my spiritual gift by taking the survey and just changing the the selections that I made on it. So if I wanted to have the spiritual gift of kindness, I knew how to answer those questions. If I wanted to have the spiritual gift of generosity, I knew how to answer those questions. And, and, and we, we kept thinking that everybody had a specific spiritual gift. Now, I'm not talking about talents. Talents are a whole different thing. I think Jim Ashworth has the talent to play the guitar. I don't. I may have the ability but I haven't practiced, I haven't learned, I haven't done anything to develop that. So my talent uh, is playing the three chords that I know how to play. And I'm always amazed to watch Jim play 50,000 different chords in one song, and I look at him and say, I wonder how he does that. Well, because he's, he's expanded on his talent. I'm not talking about talents. When you start talking about compassion, Gentleness, kindness, love, those are spiritual gifts that we should all have collectively and that God provides what we need for the day that we need them. So if I need to be compassionate today, I believe that the Spirit of God gives me compassion. If I need to be kind today, I believe the Spirit of God gives me kindness. 
If the Spirit of God today knew that I needed to be a, a, a compassionate, empathetic person, he gave me the ability to do that. So I believe that the rich man not only had all these resources, but he also had the ability to be compassionate. He also had the ability to be generous. He also had the ability to be kind. All of those were within his makeup, but he chose not to do that. Remember that parable where Jesus said, all these things that could have been done, they didn't do, therefore I don't know who they are. But there will be a group of people that will stand before me one day, and I will say to them, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you ministered to me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And what will those people say? They will say, when did we ever see you like that? I mean, after all, if Jesus were here and hungry, we'd, we'd fight over ourselves to try to find something to give him, wouldn't we? If Jesus were to walk in the door and say, I'm thirsty, we would run in there and we would push out each other out of the way to get a bottle of water out of the refrigerator because Jesus is thirsty. But what if Jesus came as a blind beggar full of sores and the dogs were licking his wounds? What if that Jesus walked in our door and said, I'm hungry? Or I'm thirsty. What would the internal compass say? What is inside of me that says, be compassionate, be kind, be gentle, take care of this man's needs? Do you know what that is? That's the Spirit of God that dwells within us. That's how come Jesus knows my name. That's how I know that God knows me by name. Because his spirit is within me. And that character is who I have become. Perfect every time? No. I often wondered how Lazarus got in the situation that he was in. There's all kinds of things. Have you ever been, have you ever been around homeless people or people who live on the side of the road? I've met some very interesting people in downtown Atlanta. I met a brain surgeon who was homeless. I'm not sure that he was a brain surgeon, but that's what he told me he was. I've met lawyers, doctors, Indian chiefs, and there they were in line to get a hot dog at a homeless shelter or a mission. Sometimes you hear this story. I drank everything I had away. Now my family's gone. My job's gone. My whole life's gone. And so what do we say to those people? Well, you deserved it. I mean, all you had to do was stop drinking. All you had to do was get your life straight. All you had to do was just function well in society and all your problems would have gone. What you need is Jesus. And do you know how many times night after night after night in inner city missions people get saved over and over and over and over again? Because the person up front says, all you need is Jesus and all your problems will go away. Sometimes we're like the rich man and never meet the needs of the person. The emphasis here is that the rich man who had everything lost it all. Abraham says to him, child? What does that tell you? If Abraham called him a child, who was he? He was a Jewish person, a child of Abraham. Child, remember that during your life, you received all these good things. And likewise, Lazarus had nothing. Doesn't necessarily mean that people who are wealthy are not known by God. Doesn't necessarily mean that people who are poor are known by God. 
there is that internalness of accepting Christ, the internalness of accepting God, the internalness of exercising our faith, which makes us righteous. I lost it all. And now what happens to the rich man? We spend way too much time talking about the hot and the water and the begging. But do you hear what he has become? He has become compassionate. Send somebody back and tell my five brothers who act just like me. Go back and tell my five brothers, straighten up. Send somebody back from the dead. If somebody, from, maybe he was even saying, send me back so I can warn them to stop doing what they're doing. All right, understand that? How many times have we got to, to the place in our lives where we wished we could tell people behind us, don't go where I went. Don't, don't do the things that I've done. It's important that you hear Moses. It's important that you hear the prophets. It's important that you listen when the word of God is being proclaimed. It is important that you interact with God. Don't leave him out of your life. Because there will be a point where that's not so good. I don't like to preach about hell being fire and brimstone. It's far, it's far worse than that. Hell is not internal damnation where you burn eternally. And, and, and I, I've heard preachers preach all that. It's worse than that. It's far worse than that. It's the place where God is not. Period. Do you know how we have hell on earth today? It's the place where God is not. God doesn't dwell in my heart. God doesn't dwell in my family. God doesn't dwell in my environment. God is, God is absent from, from me. And we begin to understand how hellacious that can be. But can you imagine an eternity without God? This morning I exercised hope. This morning I believe in hope. I believe that there's a promise because I believe that a God has prepared a place for us. And I believe that God invites us there and that God wants to know our name. He desires to know our name. He's never going to see us in Target and say, who are you? He's never going to recognize our face and not know our name. I want him to know me. I want to be a part of this family. Why? Because the promise is so good. When we exercise that kind of hope, I could... I can say to you today that even if God does not exist, if I were to die and find out that that's it, you just die, I've lost nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because I've lived my life with a certain sense of hope and it's made life bearable for me. It's made life good for me. I've met some really good people passing through life. I've loved people, and people have loved me, and that's been a great and wonderful relationship. I've understood that I can give hope sometimes to people that are desperate, that are maybe like Lazarus was. Sometimes I can touch their lives, or I can interact with them with a hope that I believed in. But if we, if we pass into eternity and there's absolutely nothing there, I've lost nothing because I've lived compassionate. And I've lived kind, and I've lived gentle, and I've understood love. And people have been compassionate to me, and people have shown gentleness to me. It's worth living that way. Some of the most miserable people I know are people who have more resources than they know what to do with and have not God. Some of the most struggling people I've ever met in my life are people that were, that were very fortunate in this life but have lost it all because inside they were empty I don't want to be a rich man 
I don't want to be a refuser. I want to be Steve. I want God to know my name. Because if I gain it all, if I build bigger barns, if I say, my, oh, my, I am on a bull market here. I'm, man, things are just going great for me. I've got more resources than I can count. I'll build some bigger barns and I'll have more and I won't have to worry about anything in life and have God say, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. And your children are going to fight over your barns. I'll say it again. I have never attended a funeral. And I've attended a lot of them where there was a U-Haul trailer hooked up to the hearse. You can't take it with you. I imagine the rich man could have said, I wish I had my air conditioning. <laughs> you know, I had the best air conditioner in town in my house right there in Jerusalem. I could cool my whole house. I had central heating and air. Nobody else in town had it, but I did. And I bet in his circumstance, he wished he could have his air conditioning. I had the best will in town. I had a well that was so deep, it was cold water, it was crystal clear. It was the best water in town. I never gave Lazarus any of that water, by the way poor beggar guy. I bet the rich man in his circumstances would have said, I wished I could dip a cup of water out of my well. Not because hell is fiery. It's because all the good things that he had were no more. And the things that he failed to invest in were the things that were most important. You think Lazarus had sores when he got to heaven? You think dogs were licking his wounds when he got to heaven? You know what? I think Lazarus sat down to the biggest spread of food that man could ever imagine. Every kind of food that he could want was set down before him. What good is if you gain everything lose your own soul. Dear Father, help us to see today that being rich is not a sin, but not being compassionate leaves us outside your perfect will. Having wealth does not mean that we are condemned to an eternal hell for all eternity, but forgetting to be compassionate and kind to others leaves us outside your realm. That today when you look at us, you see those that are called by name and then you see sometimes rich people or people that you can't call by name because they've left you out of their environment. We pray, Father, today that all of us would be satisfied within our being that you know us and that we know you and that whatever hope we live day in and day out, carries us through this life, and we look forward to the day when we, as Lazarus did, moves from here to there. We pray, Father, that just because we have great wealth and just because we feel like we have been blessed with more than the other, that you would help us to understand that's not a qualification of yours. As a matter of fact, you still say to us over and over again, Go sell everything you've got. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. Would we do that if our eternity rested on it? No. Convict our heart today to be more like you. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake.